I'm delighted to be introducing tonight's speaker, Edmund Le Hart. Edmund is well known to many in this audience as one of Britain's foremost ceramic artists and as a writer on contemporary and historical ceramics. Captivated by throwing pots, and I hope not literally, from a young age, apparently five, Edmund's early apprenticeship with the British potter Geoffrey Whiting, a follower of Bernard Leach, was followed by a degree in English literature from Cambridge University. After which he returned to practice as a potter in Britain and in Japan and established his own studio. His most renowned public commissions as a ceramic artist include the installations at the Geoffrey Museum in London in 2001, at the Duke of Devonshire's estate at Chatsworth in 2006, and at Kettle's Yard in Cambridge in 2007, and his most recent permanent installation, which you can all go and see. Um, is Signs and Wonders for the newly reopened Ceramics Galleries at Victoria and Albert Museum that opened last year. In addition to his activity as a ceramic artist, Edmund is a professor of ceramics at Westminster, the University of Westminster in London, and has written widely on many aspects of European and Japanese ceramics. But neither Edmund's career as a ceramic artist and historian, nor his childhood spent in the shadow of Canterbury Cathedral, where his father was dean, prepares one of the extraordinary topic of the book that he's recently published, The Hair with the Amber Eyes, which is the subject of tonight's talk and of our slide here. And yet, perhaps Edmund's formative experiences in Japan do some way account, in some way account for it, since it's the collection of 264 Japanese netsuke, the inheritance from his great uncle Iggy, that prompts the tracing of this extraordinary, and I quote here from Edmund, biography of a collection and biography of a, mute, of a family, which is about loss and diaspora and about the survival of objects, to quote Edmund again. But I should let Edmund further unfold that story for you tonight, for as he expresses so eloquently in this remarkable book, you take an object from your pocket and put it down in front of you, and as you start, you begin to tell a story. So please welcome Edmund, who will also take um, questions after his talk. Those are the things that I will share with you tonight. 
but those are the things, of course, that we're always here in this place to talk about objects, families, and memory. It's a story about Netsuke. Now, Netsuke is not that big. <laughs> They're very small, <laughs> my brother. And against the better advice of everyone, this Netsuke is going to travel around the audience doing this talk. <laughs> and because you're wonderful people, you're going to give me back. <laughs> By uh, Masters and Masterpieces by a man called Kazu 1770, which is about turtles, and turns up in the book. So, while I'm talking about turtles, there will be something that pleases that circulate, but I really do want the back again. <laughs> so, 264 Netscape is an odd inheritance. It comes from my great uncle Iggy, and we'll get to Iggy, my lovely. The lovely great uncle at the end. It's an odd inheritance. They are small, tactile, complicated little objects, full of meaning, full of humour, quirkiness. They're rats uh, uh, and uh, tortoises and tigers. They are craftsmen and samurai. All kinds of people are there. And they're made of different subjects. And they're made of ivory, they're made of bone, they're made of fossil. They all have different weight. When you pick up this one, when it gets to you, you'll find it. Well, I'm not to tell you what it feels like, but it's extraordinary. And it's quite an odd inheritance for me, because I make pots. What I do in my day job is to make installations of pots, groups of porcelain, which I bring together. This is called a change in the weather. 365 pots. And I make balls of pots. This is for a house in London with small children. <laughs> They're rather wonderful times. And I make work which comes out of looking at pictures and thinking about pictures and thinking about spaces between people. Prudella, a piece which is based around um, a wonderful uh, uh, medieval altarpiece. So I make work in porcelain, which is about touch, and it's also about framing objects. Um, I make it for the slightly grander uh, people, like the Duke of Devonshire. Uh, Get my dukes on the lap, shaking how far away from home, wouldn't do that in England. Get the dukes. <laughs> um, where he asked me to make work when he owned it, when he inherited Chatsworth, to run along a long corridor and, and talk in some kind of way with his great collection of 18th century porcelain. So, installations, but work which is absolutely about touch, not only for the grander people in the, you know, with, 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 their, with their castles but also for contemporary buildings, for, for people who live in more contemporary spaces as well. So porcelain, objects, and spaces. So inheriting a collection like this is quite odd, <laughs> very odd indeed. And the story is one that starts in Paris, because the family comes from Odessa. They were Jewish. And they were ridiculously rich. They were crazily, oligarchically, dot commy, madly rich. <laughs> they cornered is that an appropriate thing? Yes. No, they cornered they cornered the market in grain. They were grain merchants. Originally come from Shtetl, and they caught they made so much money that in the 1850s they decided to do a Rothschild. They decided to send their children out to different bits of Europe. And, and, and conquer Europe. They would marry good Jewish girls into the dynasties, and they would become bankers, and they would become European players in money. And that's what they did. So one lot of sons went to Paris, and one lot went to Vienna. And this is where the story starts in Paris in the 1870s. Oh, now I've told you to do that. Now it's going to help me to put this back together again. <laughs> <laughs> Same boat. Same boat. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say so techno -phobic. <laughs> <laughs> Please bear with me. Please bear with me. I was going to show you where they are, but I don't dare use the pointer anymore. If I look right up at the top, there's a thing called the Parc de Monceau. Okay? And underneath that, you've got very good eyesight. Rue de Monceau. Okay. So the French lot go here. There are three sons and they're sent to Paris. And they're sent 
in order to establish divinity in Paris. So what do they do when they're in Paris? Well, they go to the Rue Monceau. They go to this beautiful hill of golden buildings. And this hill is full of Jewish families. You have the Rothschilds, you have the Commandos, you have all these great families. And they all build houses on the street. And this is where the story starts. This is the Hotel Ephrasie. Family we call the Ephrasi, and this is their Parisian headquarters. This is where the story starts. And this beautiful building, I'm not going to use the point of it, scares the hell out of me. You look at the third floor, you put the third floor in America, look just below the top balcony. That's the floor that matters. Now, the key thing about this book, sorry, I just get very thirsty and I get quite excited when I'm talking. The key thing about this book was that I promised. But it's not, it's not a Google book. Okay, this is a book where I had to go. I promised myself that I was going to take the story of these objects seriously. It was going to be a place, a book that I went to every place that this collection had been in. And so this was very, very important for me, that I went to every single place. God bless you, look at this nice man. Okay, this. <laughs> okay, this is exactly what I expected from the Getty. And who lives here? It's the third son who lives here. There are three sons, I'll say. The first goes into the bank, goes to Jewish family, first goes into the bank. The second son is a playboy. Love affairs, dueling, climbing out of windows, getting into scrapes, the whole nine yards. The third son is this man, the man on the right, Charles de Frissy. And Charles, here he is, walking down the room also in his top hat with his cane under his arm, and in front of him, that's his secretary, who was a poet called Jules Lafourque, a wonderful, wonderful, extraordinarily beautiful poet about cities. So Charles is 21, he arrives in Paris, he's given a floor of that golden building, <coughs> he has ridiculous amounts of money, so what does he do? Well, he's a lover of art, he's passionate, passionate about art, and so what he does is he starts to buy art. And this is where the collection starts. What does he buy for these empty rooms? It's a great enfilade, room after room after room. The first thing he buys is this astonishing Renaissance tapestry. And in that niche, he buys a, a satire by Della Robbia. The great, we've got one up in, 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 um, in Pavilion. Let me guess right. The North Pavilion. Okay, come in a mic. If you go into the North Pavilion and look up, there's a great uh, figure, a face coming out of, out of the wall. Well, that's by Della Robbia. And Charles' first purchase is this thing, and he puts a great satire there. And his second great purchase is this bed. Now, imagine being 21 and having a bed like that. <laughs> <laughs> you will notice, because you're all incredibly accepted people, that he puts the ethnicity E embroidered on it. So it's a kind of Medici bed for this young man. And then into this room looking out of the room. So, what else does he buy? He buys a famous carpet of the Golden Winds from the Louvre. Woven into the Louvre, he buys it, and then it's a shame thing, he cuts it down to size. <laughs> so, so you, okay, you have to remember, so you have to keep, keep this in your mind. Okay, you've got embroideries, you've got a, 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 a Della Robbia, you've got a golden carpet underneath, um, and you've got a Donatello head as well, that he buys. And he's a, a, a passionate about art. And so he starts writing for the local magazine, the Great Gazette de Bazaar. And because he's kind of frisky, he starts writing for it, he writes beautifully about things, and then he edits it and then he buys it. <laughs> <laughs> so he's a writer about art. And when I was in the Louvre, you know, I found this one, this is a dinner party list. Um, and a third of these people are artists, and a third of them are writers, and a third of them are socialites. And so you get the sense of a good dinner party mm -hmm. at 81 Rue de Monceau. This is Charles, my Charles, my Charles. Uh, this is a, an evening with Charles. So lots of good conversation about life in Paris and poetry and art. And where do we start to see Charles? Well, there he is at the back with his top hat on. Because that's Charles. That's my Charles. And 
man he is. Extraordinary. At a boating party, everyone else is in boaters or bareheaded or with flowers in their hair. Everyone, and there he is, he's wearing a top hat. He's wearing the uniform of the collector, the patron, because he was a friend of artists, a real friend. He buys extraordinary paintings. He starts his collection in the 1870s in Paris. He starts his collection with Renoir, this beautiful, beautiful picture of the gypsy girl. And there's a cousin of mine in the audience, and this, her grandmother, I'm going to come to the story, it's just too good a story, sorry. We might have run, but I'll get to the story. <coughs> he buys Renoir, he buys this extraordinary beauty now in Chicago. He buys this beautiful Monet, which is at the National Gallery, and I, I, I'm taking my children, stand in front of it and say, that's not yours. <laughs> And 
That's extraordinary because this collection of golden objects sort of feed in to Charles's writing about art. And so this is the moment that Charles finally buys Netscape. He buys this collection of Netscape because if you think about that golden room with the brocades and <coughs> the pictures seven deep, you know, the Dega, the Sisley, the Pissarro, all those pictures. The other thing you have in your salon, when you're having your wonderful uh, aesthetic conversations and your conversation of all kinds of things, you have the truth. You have a, a glass case with objects. And after dinner, you open up your tree and you hand things around. Objects are handed around and you begin conversations around objects. So this is where Charles begins his collection. He buys a huge tree. Black, taller than a tall man, in the memory of my great uncle, and fills it with Netscape. And that's where it starts. And so, while his brothers are racing their horses in the Epusi colours of Longchamp, <laughs> and while his great aunt Beatrice is building the uh, chalet Epusi or Chine la and well, his uncle is buying this, which is in Rome, <laughs> <laughs> in the South Pavilion. I can then make a joke and say, I can't take it all home. <laughs> <laughs> what is happening? Because there is a change in taste. What's happening is that Charles is getting grander. And you feel this. These are the things that he's surrounded by. This is at the time of the Dreyfus Affair. There's huge pressure on Jewishness in, in, in Paris for the first time. Jews are really under pressure. And he and his family start to change their taste. This is French taste. And his nephew is building this, which is the Villa Kirillos, which I think is the, the precursor of the Getty Villa. This is there. And my grandmother remembers saying this in about 1910, remembered, and all the servants had to wear togas. <laughs> terrible, really. But what's happening? Taste is changing, and Charles starts to write about other kinds of things, not the impressions of Baudry, he starts collecting uh, Gustave Moreau, um, and there's a terrible, terrible moment in Renoir's letters, where Renoir describes coming up the staircase and seeing this new picture that Charles has just bought and saying, it's Jew art, it's full of gold. It's a moment of terrible separation between Renoir and Charles, a moment of, of horror, uh, because he can't bear his patron going off with other artists. And what is Charles doing? He's buying French furniture. This is school in the cabinet. He's buying empire furniture. He's building himself a bigger house. And surely, here he is, Charles, suddenly in this bigger house with French furniture, with Gobelin tapestries, with Sarah, all the things which are in your, probably your West Pavilion, I can't remember where it is anymore. <laughs> all those extraordinary suites of Frenchness that he surrounds himself with. There is no place left, there's no place left for a, a vitrine of Netscape. He's got two grand for them. And so what does he do? It's 1899. What he does is he sends it away. He gives away the tomb and the Netscape. And he gives it away. And he sends it to Vienna. Now let's see if I can get to my tablet of technology here. Here we go. He sends it here. This is the, the Ringstrasse of Vienna. This is the university. This is the Volkswagen. The Hofburg. The Opera is just down here. You'll be able to concentrate. So I feel like a French person in the archive. That's <laughs> Where does he send it to? He sends it to his first, his first cousin, his favourite cousin in Vienna. Remember, Paris and Vienna. He sends it to Vienna. He sends it to this place, which is the Viennese house of the Epicy. This is the Palais Epicy, which had been rebuilt for the Viennese branch. And you can see that it's even bigger and even more vulgar than the Parisian one. It's a very strange place. 
It's extraordinarily big. It's on the Rinse Trust facing the university. And it's, I stood outside it and, and had huge problems with it because it, it's, it, it struck me that this is, the, this is the place where you say you're not going to have birth. This is the house that a, a very rich Jewish family would build, a, a bit, would build when they're saying, we're not wandering Jews. This is where we start. We're proud of who we are. This is where we are. But it is quite something. It's a house full of gilt and marble and chandeliers. It's a complicated house for me in terms of touch to be in. And I stood here in this ballroom and it took me a very long time to work out what was going on in this family house, this Jewish family house, on this great ring of houses which was called by the anti-Semitic press, Zion Strasser, Jewish. And I stood under this, this ceiling and then I realized what was going on. Because up here is the coronation of Esther. And there is the destruction of the enemies of the Jews. So in this extraordinary, belle epoque, gilded house, they are saying something very profound about who they are and their identity. It's just really rather a lot of this. And so Charles sends the tree. He sends it for the wedding of my great-grandfather Victor, who was marrying uh, the girl from the palais next door. <laughs> Emmy Shai von Karoma. She is. She's very good on hats. <laughs> and he sent it, and there are wedding presents from all over Europe. Charles sends it to Petrine, uh, Jules, the older banker son, in Paris, sends an extraordinary Jacob desk, extraordinarily beautiful French desk. And the woman who had the great pink, do you remember that great pink, Catherine Villa, Beatrice, she sends a Bellini. <laughs> <laughs> and it has to fit somewhere in this house. And, um, it's extraordinary because this, at this moment, this is where it kicks in with memory. This is where it kicks in with hearing about my grandma, from my grandmother. Because her mother, Amy, this astonishing person, here she is in a secessionist album by Albrecht dancing. And here she is dressed up as a petition. And here she is in her happiest of all. And here she is with one of her lovers. She had lots of lovers. This is an archduke. But look at that dress, that's something. Someone who knows how to dress. Where's the retreat go? It can't fit anywhere in the house. It can't fit in the... It's a house that the Prusins collect from the Viennese shop. That's the basic point about the Palais of Prusy. It's got hundreds of paintings. It's got astonishing furniture. Uh, it's crammed with objects. Um, but it doesn't really fit. This odd retreat with Metzke. Where will it fit? And finally, my great grandmother had to says, well, it, we can, I'll put it in my dressing room. And she put this into her dress, the view from her dressing room across to the votive cafe. And so this is the place it goes. And this is the important thing, because it's this room, we moved from a salon in Paris to a very intimate, intimate space. It had a chaise long, it had a big mirror, and it had a vitrine. And here, this is my great, this is my grandmother on the train they took down to Paris. And here, with her sister Gisela, um, this is where the children played with the Netsky. Because what happened, it was a terrible formal house. There were 17 servants. There were conventions, all those conventions that you imagine in a very stultifying, tough Viennese house. But the one time they were out to see their mother was the hour when she was dressing to go out. She'd go out, that's why she had all the pictures of hats. She went out an awful lot. And so they would come in for an hour, and their mother would talk to them, and they would open the vitrine, and they would play with the Minsky, and they were allowed to play. And while my great grandmother's maid, Anna, local Viennese girl, Gentile girl, would sew her into a dress or choose jewelry or do all those things, that maids did. Children talk to their mother, and this is the moment when the stories start happening because it's incredibly powerful. This is the moment that they choose their favorite objects and they move them around on the carpet 
Uh, and their mother picks up a few cheap. My grandmother was, in, was, who was not in the motion, she was a very reserved person, who would talk in old age about the fact that her mother, who she barely saw, would pick up a Netscape or two and start to tell a story to the children as she was being dressed. So from Paris to, to this incredibly intimate, intimate life in Vienna. And that's the second place in the story of the next game. And what's so extraordinary is that all the children grow up in this terrible, <coughs> marble, gilt, stuffed house. But what's extraordinary, really extraordinary, is that my grandmother, who was a very reserved and very strong person, made the decision when she was only 12 that she was going to move, this is her bedroom here, that she was going to move from here to here. She was going to get to that university. And she studied with her father, she took tutors, and she, and she did it. She got, which is very unusual, she got from one side of the Ringstrasse to the other side of the Ringstrasse. And this strange adventure I had on, on the journey of objects, this is something that suddenly appealed to me and made sense suddenly of their life. This is my grandmother's opera book from Vienna. And here, suddenly, you see the texture of their life. You see that they went to the Berg Theatre, they went to the opera, they go to see Wagner. And look how often they go. And those are the people they go with, the gazella, with the, the mama and papa, with Anna, the maid. All these things are going on. And this is the texture of Jewish life the First World War. This is the texture of cultured life in Vienna. This is this extraordinary time, a suspended time almost, for the Jewish inhabitants of Vienna. And my grandmother, as she is, she was a poet, she was a lawyer, and she got away, and she married. And my great uncle, Ignace, he is a young man, hand in pocket. He also got away. He didn't want to be part of the dynasty. He couldn't cope with the idea of being the next Baron of Christie, the next banker in the family, the next person who had to walk every day with his ballet to the bank and uh, survive all that thing. But he was gay and he loved fashion, and so he ran away. He ran to New York. Well, there he is. He got away. He was terrible at fashion. But he did get away from New York. And there, it's terrible fashion. <laughs> but you know what happens. It's the 1930s, and you know what happens next. And for me, the, the complexity about the story was, was very, very intense because the complexity was that how could I possibly write about what happened next? Because we know what happens next. And the challenge for me of writing about 1938 and what happened to the family um, was a challenge about real storytelling. About real storytelling uh, about the things that matter and about the memories that need to be explored and passed on. And I found this bit so hard to write. I took myself away and I still couldn't write it and I still find it very painful to have had to go through the process of writing about this. Because on the night that the tanks cross the border into Austria in 1938, the doorman of the palais, who'd been working there for 35 years, guarding the door, left the doors open. And Bud's neighbours came and they broke down the door of the palais, the apartment, and they assaulted my great grandfather, Victor, who was in his 70s. And they picked up that movie, Sarah's desk, that had been sent all that lifetime before in Paris, and they threw it down the well of the palais, and they robbed the family, and they 
broke objects and they basically took revenge on this Jewish family that could be their neighbors. And the next morning, my great-grandfather was made to dig a ditch in front of the Palais of Frisky and got a placard off his neck. He was 78. And when the shovel broke, he had to dig it with his hands. And that moment of suddenly discovering that your neighbors have done that, well, a week after that, they start to come and every single picture is photographed. Some things just disappear. Photographs are sent off the hip to tubes. And most painfully for my great-grandfather, his library, which he spent 50 years putting together, is put into crates and disappears forever onto the rinse dresser. And art historians argue in Vienna about who has what. And he signs a document saying that the family house can be aerialized. It's that or Dachau. And finally he gets out to Czechoslovakia with my great-grandmother, but my great-grandmother commits suicide rather than give on any further. And I think that the moment of complete, complete disclosure for me about the story was discovering in an archive, in the remnants in the Jewish archive in Vienna, that someone, some functionary, some Nazi functionary, had gone through every single record of every single Jew in Vienna, following edict from Hitler, and every single Jew had been renamed. Every man had been named Israel, every woman had been named Sarah, and that someone had bothered to spend a month going through the Jewish archives to make sure that Jews had different names. Well, my great grandfather got out. Here he is in exile. But what you can't see is that on his watch chain, he had the key to his library. He still thought sometime he'd be able to go back and unlock library door. Well, my great uncle Lee, who I loved, with, when he was in America, joined up and he fought all the way across Europe in his jeep with his sister's name on it. He was General Hatton's interpreter. And in 1947, Dean at a loss of what knowing what to do, he turns up on my grandmother's door and after supper. They talk about what's going to happen. And this is the strangest thing, because my great my grandmother Elizabeth had gone back to Vienna in 1945. She'd gone back and found the house on the Rickstrasse had been bombed and that it was occupied by American officers. And she went upstairs and a lieutenant from Tennessee took her around and there was almost nothing there. There were a couple of portraits, there were a couple of chairs that couldn't be moved. Um, but the man from Tennessee said, well, there is someone here who may be able to help you, an old woman. And the old woman turned out to be her mother's maid, Anna. And Anna said, I've got something to give back to you. I've produced 264 nets here. Because when they start overtaking the house apart, she'd taken every single one of those nets to get out from the tree and she sent me to her mattress. She didn't take the precious things. Conventionally, she took the things that she mattered most. And they're the things that survive. They're the things that survive from the family. And when Iggy saw them, he said, I know what to do with them. I know exactly what to do with them. I'll take them home. But home didn't mean Europe. He never could cope with Europe again. Home, in this case, was home for the Netscape. So he took them to Japan in 1947. He took them to a devastated Japan and he built a house for the Netscape. So this is the third place in the story. He built this house, this lovely, gay, entertaining, educated Jewish man ended up in Japan with the Netsuke. 
and he gave them a very good home. Here they are, in a beautiful tree, which he would open up after supper. Here he is with his partner, Shiro. And here he is in a slightly bigger house later on. And they would open them up and hand them around and talk about them. So when I'm a young man and go to Japan, when I'm 17 to go off to be a potter, when I arrive in Tokyo, the first thing that my dear fashion designing great uncle says is, I'm not being seen with you, let's go shopping for clothes. <laughs> <laughs> the second thing he does is to tell me that there's something rather special, a story I have to know. And over the years, particularly when I go back, in my 20s, my late 20s, I hear the story about the landscape. And this story is something that I can't really work out. It's a story that I know the bones of from Iggy. I know the bare rudiments of it. But I know something very, very important about it, which is it's about identity. And so, when Iggy dies and is buried, in the temple, and I have to be there, and I'm there at the funeral and the service where he's given his Buddhist name, kindly on for his next life. Um, I say the Kaddish because there's a man who's born in Vienna and fights in the Second World War and ends up in a Tokyo graveyard. And then I inherit the Netsuke. And so what do I do? Well, I realize at a certain point that I can either tell the story as a series of anecdotes about a favorite great uncle or about an extraordinary life or all those kinds of things, or I can really work out what it means. And I still really don't know what it means. But what I did do to go back to Odessa, to go back to the place where Charles was born and where my great-grandfather Victor was born, in this beautiful house overlooking the Black Sea. And I found the house and I stood in front of it and I went round the back. <coughs> it was being renovated. And there were three big skits. There were three huge dumpsters <laughs> full of paneling and plasterwork and railings and gilding. And the guy who's doing the stuff says, I'm really glad you're here because we've just finished doing this horrible place up. It's a proper office now. And there's nothing left. So I go up and stand on that balcony there and look out over the Black Sea. In this house that was at the very start of this story, the start where these children grew up a hundred and God knows how many years ago, 140 years ago, 150, 160 years ago. But there is the house. And I am in that place and I realise that that's a possible way of starting the book, a possible way of ending the book. It's about where you start out from and where you return to in some kind of way. It's about objects. And so I come back to London and I start to try and write the book and it takes me years. But because I make things, it's very complicated and I find slowly that what I'm doing with objects changes too. That I'm putting objects high, out of reach. That I'm making this for the DNA. I'm making things which are very much about memory. And I'm making objects which are about hiddenness and objects which are about shadows and even objects in the trees. So here I am, and that's my story. And I'm very, very grateful for sharing it with you as well.
back turned going around. So look for something on either side of your spread. <laughs> Enough. I'm not dealing with these people anymore. 
I want to bring my family up. I want to look forward. I'm not going to do this anymore. And I think that's very, very interesting. And I, that's her generation. And my father's generation had never, until I started writing it, he would never talk to me about the experiences, anxious about being a refugee. He would not talk about it at all. There was silence about that. And my generation, well, we're angry. You know, but do I not spend my life dealing with Viennese lawyers? No, I do not. And I made choice to write this book, which is my way of claiming restitution in the world, not about trying to claim money back. This is the way to do it, is to tell the story as well. Uh, before we do that, will a person with the tortoises raise their hand? <laughs> 